Good morning, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is Mr. Stuart Watkins. He is a, a veteran paratrooper and Vietnam War veteran. And we're just going to have a discussion today about his experiences in the Airborne back in the day. So good morning, sir. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So Mr. Watkins and I had a chance to talk a little bit before the interview started. Uh, he was a, a distinguished graduate from ROTC, commissioned in the infantry in 1966 attended airborne ranger training, was assigned to the 2nd and 508th uh, parachute infantry in the 82nd before he shipped to Vietnam where he served as an advisor with the Viet Vietnamese Airborne. So that's a quick overview of his background. First question I've got, sir, right off the bat is what was, what was jump school like in 66? Uh, you, 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 we always hear stories that, hey, you know, y'all yeah. have it too easy today. We were in the last hard class, but I I'd be very interested to hear what your experiences were like going through airborne school. Yeah. I was not in uh, tip-top physical shape, so it was a struggle for me. I remember uh, when I finally knew I was going to graduate, it was after the last run on Tower Week. And uh, I don't remember the last quarter mile. I just remember uh, being overcome that I was still in the formation and uh, had made the cut. So, <laughs> It was uh, it was great. The black hats were mean and ugly. Um, they loved uh, that we were a bunch of second lieutenants and that they could, uh, you know, do their games about uh, uh, telling you, I want you to go over to the water buffalo and get to drink and, you know, don't be the last guy there. And then, um, then they would holler, hit it. And half the people would be running toward the water buffalo and the other half would be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And uh, anytime they said hit it, you had to go into the airborne position, of course. Yes, sir. So I managed to uh, to get through that. Um, it um, it was great. It was a, a lifetime dream come true. And uh, like I said, it was uh, it was more guts than physical condition at that point. Just uh, wanted it so bad. Oh, that's outstanding. So I. I the other thing that is really fascinating to me about your background is uh, your time as an advisor with the Vietnamese Airborne. You'd said in our pre-interview yeah. that uh, it was kind of rare for an ROTC officer to get that opportunity because it was sort of a West Point club. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, not too much. I'll get in trouble with my West Point friends. <laughs> um, no, I, I was assigned to a, the northernmost um, they called them rough puffs, but regional popular forces group and uh, I Corps up in, right next to the DMZ. Seven months later, I, I met the guy that was supposed to go to the airborne, but wound up in my position. He'd been wounded up there, and uh, I apologize for taking his slot, but uh, we became good friends. <laughs> I had to talk to the. Uh, it's like anything in the uh, in the army. Uh, nothing works automatically by magic. It was a matter of uh, a desire on my part to stay in the airborne. And so uh, if you don't take the initiative, if you don't uh, speak up for yourself, if you don't do everything you can do to get to where you want to go, you'll never get there. Um, uh, we had a, uh, a saying in the 8th Infantry Division, it was a sign on the wall of the Chief of Staff's office that says the soldiers in the field get the job done despite the guidance they're given. <laughs> uh, the actual quote. Uh, so anything I ever did, basically, I had to make happen in spite of the system. So there's a couple of examples I could give you, but uh, uh, it was the airborne make it happen spirit that, that got me through those things. Oh, that's outstanding. Now, I know that uh, you deluded when uh, General Schwarzkopf, when he was a major, he'd spent time as a uh, advisor with the Vietnamese airborne. Uh, I read in his memoir, he said that the biggest, the, the thing that kind of got his foot in the door was the fact he could speak French. Now, did you have, did you have any language capability that helped you um, give, uh, as an advisor? Yeah, I, I told you earlier, my dad was in the Air Force. I started French in the third grade in Scotland. I went to a British boys school with the tie and the blazer and the hat and cricket and rugby. So uh, I was a, I started speaking French before my voice changed. <laughs> and uh, so um, a lot of the NCOs in the Airborne Division had been trained by the uh, uh, 
Foreign Legion parachute folks in, in North Vietnam. A lot of them were Catholic. They came south because they knew what it would be like under communism. Uh, quite a few had been at Dien Bien Phu. And uh, I remember speaking French with a, uh, a Vietnamese officer and said, uh, Vous parlez français comme un uh, Parisien. You speak French like a Parisian. And about three minutes later in the conversation, he says, Non, je, uh, vous parlez français comme un Vietnamien. I said, No, rather you speak French like a Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't totally fluent, but we could understand each other. Uh, that, so uh, I'm yeah. assuming that was incredibly helpful. <laughs> well, it was. It was, and uh, had a little bit of Vietnamese and uh, some at a sector unit training at Bragg. Uh, so I, I nói chăng Việt Nam không không được bị hàng quán không nói bây giờ đi đi bao lên đi. But I could uh, say, let's get up and get on with the operation. That was about it. So, well, but, well, now we'll, I always we'll, love languages, so I, it, uh, I speak uh, enough French to get uh, a glass of wine and a. <laughs> croissant if I have to. <laughs> Very cool. What what were the unique challenges about being an advisor? How, how, how did you get okay. your, uh, your opinions voiced, especially I'm assuming as a relatively lower ranking officer, you were probably advising higher ranking experienced Vietnamese mm -hmm. paratroop officers? Well, my battalion commander in the 11th Airborne Battalion had been in combat for 11 years. Uh, the company commanders had been uh, there three to five years in combat. Um, a lot of what I did was provide uh, close air support, artillery support, medevac. Uh, I led the helicopter air assaults uh, in coordination with the 1st Cav or whoever we were near, uh, the Black Horse, uh, whoever provided the helicopter. So I was a fire support coordinator and uh, <clears throat> they didn't need a hell of a lot of it. Uh, basic infantry advice. Because, like I said, they had been in combat for a while. They had a better handle on it than most American units, because the American units would only be there for about a year. We didn't do fire bases. Um, we did the ranger thing. We were in the jungle all the time. Uh, never set up, uh, here I am in a fire base, come attack me. <clears throat> that did happen 11 days after I left, and uh, the unit uh, almost got overrun. <clears throat> Working with the 11th ACR, they uh, um, kind of insisted that we have some kind of a fire base. If we had uh, Vietnamese artillery, there would be an artillery base. Uh, when I was listening to the moon landings in 69, I was under a tree in the jungle. Uh, <laughs> that night, we camped out in what the next day would be the fire base. Me and 11 uh, or 12 Vietnamese, uh, just in the middle of nowhere. Um, in this scraped open area. So we left the next day, the brigade came in with their artillery, they were hit that night. So obviously they saw us there with nobody and figured, hey, that would be a great target. <laughs> and uh, the good Lord was looking after me. So uh, I wasn't there that night, yeah, but I was I did, I kind of under the tree uh, with my little transistor radio, <laughs> uh, listening to the moon landing said, this is weird. <laughs> What am I doing here? Okay. That is that is a was, pretty fascinating an, story, sir. That, that that's panic. the most unique moon landing story I've heard so far. That oh. I'm actually, listening to it in the field in Vietnam. Yeah. Now, now, while you were working with the Vietnamese, did they ever actually conduct any combat airborne operations? Did you ever go into in, into combat <laughs> via parachute with those guys? Um, I got ten jumps in in Vietnam. Uh, part of our deal was to guard the Saigon perimeter. Apdong drop zone was at the edge of that perimeter. Um, and you could go in in the morning, get on a C-47 or a flying boxcar 119 and make a jump. Um, I got 10 jumps, like I said, but none were actual combat jumps for an operation. They had done that a couple of years ago. And by that time there were enough helicopters. I did uh, the equivalent of probably 25 combat air assaults with, uh, with helicopters. The good thing about that, of course, is that you're more organized when you get off the helicopters than you are after a, after a combat parachute jump. But uh, I always carried a 45 with me in case we miss, miss the drop zone. <laughs> uh, shortest jump commands I ever got, uh, the little Vietnamese sergeant that, like I said, had been at Dien Bien Phu, said, came over to me. I was a captain at the time. Says, Dai Wee, you jump now, please. <laughs> 
no stand-up hookup except <laughs> so I hooked myself up and duly jumped out to uh, made the drop zone. That's so relatively informal. One of my few stand-up landings with a round parachute. <laughs> <laughs> now, were, now were you able to stay on jump status at various times throughout your career well um yes and no um i jumped with the uh, green beret parachute club at, at bragg uh, had the uh, the u.s army europe parachute team for many years in fact went to uh, st mary glees in 76 got my uh log book signed by a uh, Apollo astronauts that were on visiting Jim Lovell. In fact, Apollo 8 and 13 signed my uh, my jump log. He was on a VIP tour for NASA after uh, after Apollo 8, I guess it was, or no, it was after 13. But anyway, um, stayed on what I when I got back from Vietnam. I guess I needed the the parachuting as a, an adrenaline rush, <laughs> and. Um, got into skydiving, wound up with about uh, 1,860 some odd jumps, and still jump, of course, round parachutes with the Liberty Jump Team. And see that Liberty Jump Team. Look, looking good, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, still do skydiving. My lovely wife, Katie, bought me a new parachute three uh, years ago. Insisted I get an automatic opener in case I forgot to pull. <laughs> she hates that joke. <laughs> But uh, I love it. I, um, I, all my life, we had done demos all over Germany and uh, France. Jumped into Berlin the first time, uh, parachute jump in Berlin since World War II. Oh, wow. The, Rus the Russians wouldn't let us go over at 4,000 feet because they thought we could spy and take pictures of stuff <laughs> East German side. We landed at Tempelhof, uh, which was pretty amazing. We took off and uh, landed there. So, yeah, just uh, I, I mastered. Uh, got my master wings eventually. Uh, a lot of those jumps were sanctioned and paid for by the army. So right. I was on kind of a special duty uh, parachute status. You know, we represented the uh, U.S. Army Europe and Normandy uh, a couple of, about three different times. And that was before the, uh, uh, the reenactors took over and all the round parachute folks showed up. We were basically having a lot of fun four day party uh, people <laughs> in St. Mary Glees put us up in their houses. Uh, it was just awesome. Uh, the French in Normandy love Americans still to That's this it. very day. I would say they're probably more patriotic than most young Americans are today as far as appreciating their liberty and freedom. Yes, sir. Now, so uh, when you go, when you got back from Vietnam, I'm assuming because uh, that about the time that the army was starting to, reorganize, focus towards dealing with the Soviet threat in Europe, getting uh, the active defense and air and land battle doctrines in place and things like that. Or did, did you spend a lot of time in Germany after you got back from Vietnam? Were you part of that reorganization and that reorientation towards dealing with the Soviet Union and fighting in the full of the gap and all that stuff? Um, our uh, general defense plan was in the full of the gap. Uh, I was on orders to go to the 509th and uh, it was the Airborne Mech and uh, 8th Infantry Division at Wiesbaden. And before I got there, they changed my orders. I wound up spending three years in 568 armor. I had to go to the infantry school armor advisor to ask him what that was. That, that was an M60A1 tank battalion. So <laughs> I um, spent 13 years in Germany altogether, three different tours, um, 8th Infantry and uh, in 568 armor, uh, Three, uh, two, three, six infantry mech uh, later on in uh, third armored division spearhead, and then uh, as a primary staff officer at fifth corps, uh, the G five German American operation. Since uh, the uh, army had sent me to French and German language school, uh, in answer to your earlier question, uh, I was a foreign area officer, which is why I was at Bragg and able to jump with the uh, Special Forces uh, yes, sir. jump team. So anyway, that's kind of one over the world. I wound up being a, a combined arms officer. And that was when there were everybody was to touting uh, combined arms, but there was no uh, family support group for uh, combined arms. Yes, sir. If you stayed primarily airborne, you had a, 
a bunch of folks that looked after you. If you stayed armor, there was an armor group that looked after you. Uh, nobody looked after uh, combined arms guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was neat though, because I got to see armor from the inside out. So I had insights and uh, experience, uh, airborne infantry, mech infantry, armor, uh, commanded uh, a motorized unit in ninth division when they were doing the high tech uh, uh, medium weight division study. Yes, sir. Um, all of my uh, Humvees, I had 44 tow Humvees and an infantry company, uh, had sling loads or slings for all my vehicles. We did a complete uh, air, air insertion uh, up in, uh, in Washington state with the airlifted the entire battalion. I was actually assigned to an air cavalry brigade as an infantry commander, which that's is fascinating. I think the only time that's ever happened. But all that combined arms stuff came together for me. So uh, we could rig and extract within five minutes. Everybody could hook up their stuff and be ready to move out smartly. That's outstanding. Now, did you all have a back of the, I remember reading about 9th ID being an experimental unit and Absolutely. Your stuff like your scouts had dirt bikes yeah. and you had weird fast attack vehicles. Uh, did you have all that craziness? We, we didn't have the craziness. We, we were the second generation. I remember General Shali Kashvili asked me one time, did I think uh, flak jackets were any good? I didn't wear one in Vietnam. And he was worried about uh, how many airplanes it would take to load out the division. So he wanted lighter weight. And uh, he asked me if, uh, if everybody ought to have a flak jacket. And I said, no, sir, they ought to have five. They ought to sit on one, wear one, and have three on the floor <laughs> in this plastic truck you call a Humvee. <laughs> that was before the up-armored Humvees. Um, I commanded all the U.S. forces that weren't in uh, Bosnia at one point. And we were the only ones there that didn't have armored vehicles. We had Humvees. Uh, I squawked about it and uh, eventually got the add-on armor plate kit. So yes, sir. Foot bucket where you could put your foot in a Kevlar bucket and at least uh, be partially buried. Um, anyway, that's, that's kind of an aside. But uh, um, Going to war in a plastic truck didn't appeal to me. Well, understandably so, <laughs> and, we, and we saw the consequences of that once we went into Iraq in 2003. Well, they uh, up-armored everything so that the IEDs explosion would be trapped inside the vehicle and scramble everybody. It was, it was just a, bad news all around. Roger that, sir. And uh, interesting times, like the old Chinese curse. So. Uh, those up-armored up kits, too, could, well, they added weight, and there was no no uh, changes to the powertrain or anything like yeah, that, so we put a lot of stress on it. Or whatever yeah. else, yeah. Uh, it would still made sense uh, if you have to march 15 clicks to an objective or drive. Obviously, you'd be in better shape when you got there if you drove. Yeah, and, uh, so it made quite a bit of sense. I actually also got to command the last task force of Desert Storm, and uh, with the 44 tow Humvees, our mission was actually to hold the Iraqis off long enough to evacuate the embassy. Should uh, the 200 tanks in Basra decide to die for the glory of the fatherland? <laughs> um, and we could have done that with overlapping fires and whatever else. I did it actually with tanks. It was funny because uh, the armor uh, battalion that was assigned to me as part of my task force was actually 568 armor uh, that I had been in 15, 20 years before. That's it was awesome. called 377 armor by then. It was in the 1st Armored Division. They reflagged uh, Spearhead 3rd Armored in 1st Armored. Yes, sir. So, so interesting times, but um, it would have been easy. You know, we could have hit them with long range fires and, and uh, leapfrog back. And we had a Marine uh, floating unit in the Gulf that was supposed to reinforce us if we got in trouble, but it would have been all over by the time they got there. Yes, sir. Now, when, when did you retire, sir? Uh, 1997. I was in from 67 to 97. Uh, I actually got in in, uh, in 67, not 66, but uh, um, 30 years. I actually got out five months early so that I could say I left on my own accord. <laughs> Tell me to leave. Not that, uh, yeah, that uh, gives you a little insight into my outlook at that point. Understood, sir. Uh, 
I loved it. I, I really did. And I don't miss it. Um, I love the jumping, and that's why I'm still active. At, uh, I'll be 75, I guess, in September. And uh, gravity still works. Uh, <laughs> parachute still opens, and uh, uh, the skydiving is a lot of fun. How did you get wrapped up with the Liberty Jump Team, sir? How did you first learn about these guys? Well, I knew that there was going to be a 75th anniversary of D-Day, and I didn't want to be one of those guys that showed up at the last minute uh, and say, oh, I want to go, I want to go. Um, so I joined a couple of years before that, or a year or so at least before that, to, and, uh, and wanted to be a solid member of the unit before, you know, going over with them. Um, it was kind of a nostalgia trip to, to jump with a, a modified T10. That's how, that was the canopies I jumped first in uh, sport parachuting. Um, had, uh, I'm not sure, a hundred or so military jumps over the, over the years with T10s, round parachutes. Um, just the, the comradeship, the, the uh, common experience, uh, being with folks, uh, that uh, shared that that airborne spirit uh, was really uplifting. It, it really boosted my morale and uh, uh, loved every minute of it. Just the, the folks that were there, the veterans, more you know, that we met, uh, talked to, uh, both here and overseas, uh, just made it a, a super positive experience all the way around. So. They're a great, uh, great group of folks, and uh, I'm proud and pleased to be uh, on the team with them. Well, fantastic, sir. That's that's outstanding. I'm glad you've been able to retain your airborne spirit and, and continue to uh, participate yeah. in airborne operations. That is fabulous. Yeah. So we're just about out of time, sir. Uh, oh, I would love for you to talk about that piece of ordnance real quick, though. <laughs> I decided not too long ago to try to collect one of every different uh, weapon from the Civil War through the current day. And uh, of course, that's uh, the paratrooper version, the M1A1 carbine. Um, also, my dad, real quick, was in the uh, Army Air Corps and flew B-29. So my wife and I, for the last 10 years, have been crew members on Fifi, the only, one of the only flying B-29s left in the world. So, wow. Um, in order to survive and excel at 75, 85, 95, uh, whatever, uh, you got to stay uh, linked in with people with uh, airborne spirit, or in that case, uh, looking after a B-29. Uh, it keeps you young and it keeps you uh, driving on, airborne all the way. Airborne, sir, that is awesome. So yeah, you, you piqued the, my interest now. Uh, so did, did your dad operate in the Pacific or, or in the ETO? Uh, Pacific B 29s. He wound up on Guam at the end of the war flying an F 13, which I didn't know what that was. I had to Google it. It's a photo recon B 29. Oh, wow. He was, uh, did single ship mission and then uh, flew when I was in Scotland, like I said earlier, in the British Boys School. That was because he was at Prestwick in air rescue. Flew a B 29 with a 30 foot lifeboat underneath, that dropped with a 100 foot cargo chute uh, to downed aircraft in the North Atlantic. That is cool. SB-29, and, uh, search so and rescue. How long did your dad stay in the Air Force? Um, pretty much uh, 27 years or so. He got out, went to pharmacy school, had a wife, two kids, and uh, graduated in two and a half years. Then got recalled for Korea. To send, uh, he was a pharmacist at that point. Uh, decided he'd rather fly than push pills. So he <laughs> stayed, stayed in the Air Force. And uh, I got my first B-29 when I was nine years old. So. Uh, that was my kind of hook that got me into, <laughs> into that sort of thing. And uh, I met uh, the Liberty Jump team when uh, the B-29 was at uh, Air Force Base at Lackland at uh, San Antonio. They were there. Uh, their C-47 had broken down. They came very close to getting to jump a C-17, which appealed to me. And then yeah. there was a, a chicken uh, brigadier that said, well, maybe that's not a good idea. Everybody uh, wanted to make it happen, except this one person. So, um, like I said earlier on, anything that ever happened, happened through force of will, not because the system worked as it should. Roger, that's, but, uh, it. that's, uh, that's like mission orders and square point and uh, Heck yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. 
Anyway. Know the commander's intent, move to the sound of the guns. Yeah, move out smartly, trust your troops. Uh, they can tell in five minutes or less if you're a pony. Roger that, sir. And that, that is that is great yeah. advice. And that's a great note to go on. <laughs> sir, thank you so much for spending the morning with us. I really enjoyed it. Our guest today has been Mr. Stuart Watkins, uh, combined too, arms officer and paratrooper extraordinaire. I've really enjoyed our talk, sir. Thank you so much and have a great morning. Airborne. All thank the way, you. sir. <laughs>